كلمة منك ربي بتكفي غير حالي ومرضي تشفي وترفعني من وسط ضعفي وتبدل خوفي بسلام كلمة منك ربي بتكفي غير حالي ومرضي تشفي وترفعني من وسط ضعفي تبدل خوفي بسلام انت قادر يا رب قادر ما بيعسر ولا امر عليك انت قادر ايوه انت قادر تبدل حال اللي ناديك انت قادر يا رب قادر ما بيعسر ولا امر عليك انت قادر ايوه انت قادر يبدل حال اللي ندي Welcome to the May Conference 2021 hosted by the Arabic Baptist Church. We thank you for joining us and uh, we look forward to spending this time of worship together with you. Uh, even though it's online, we can still praise God even from our homes. Uh, we know that uh, King David used to praise God out in the field. So if you can praise God out in the field, we can praise and worship God wherever we might be, whether it's in the car, whether you're watching at home and uh, or over your telephone, we thank you for joining us. This is actually the second day of our conference. And if for some reason you were unable to join us yesterday, uh, Pastor John spoke about the good news from uh, John chapter 10, and he asked us to read John chapter eight. Uh, if for some reason you were unable to watch that, you can find it uh, online and you can go back and watch that sermon. Uh, today we uh, continue with the theme of the gospel, the good news. As a young boy, one of the uh, favorite things that we could ever hear from our parents is when they used to say, we have some good news for you, which usually meant that something we desired or wished for was about to come true. Or if you were out in the yard and you heard the sound of the ice cream truck, just the sound of it brought a smile and you went running because you wanted some ice cream. Well, we hope that the words and the songs that you hear today will bring a smile to your face, bring a word of encouragement. Perhaps you're lonely, you're hurting, perhaps you've lost friends or loved ones, you've lost your job and you just need some good news. Well, we're here to encourage you and to love you with the words and the songs from the gospel. Uh, Nicole and Nate and the praise team will continue their worship this morning and we just ask that you would sing along wherever you might be and that uh, you would worship God with the words and sing along with us and let us worship God and bring the good news to all those around us.
sing about the great name of Jesus now.
Hey everyone, welcome back. We are so excited to be with you once again for another night of worship. Uh, we just hope that you join us and sing out to God. And uh, I don't know what else to say. What do you yeah. want to say? <laughs> just lift up his name together wherever you are. You can get up on your feet. Uh, whatever you need to do, just get your heart in that place right now where you're ready to meet and experience God and his goodness. Amen.
Thank you for the wonderful praise and worship. We thank you for the talents that you have that you use to glorify God and to worship and to lead us in worship through your songs and your musical talents. Indeed, as they sang and we all sang, how great is our God. I wonder if you can say those very same words. If for some reason you're having trouble saying how great is our God, right? maybe you are having trouble saying that because of the circumstances of your life right now. For me, when I go outside and I see the incredible wonders of nature and the moon that is hanging on nothing, I'm often stopped in my tracks and say, how great is our God? Because we had nothing to do with that. Well, Pastor John is going to continue with the theme of the gospel and show us what a great and mighty God we, in fact, do serve. And so I pray that you would have your Bible. If you don't, go grab it or open up your, your Bible app and uh, tune in with John and uh, follow along with him as he actually preaches from the Gospel of John. And uh, may you be blessed. Hey, so we started out yesterday talking about how we live in a dark world and things are upside down. There are politics that divide us, religion divides us, traditions divide us. We've got this worldwide culture that seems okay with violence and vengeance. Religions are at war, political enemies are at war, and at the end of the day, people come home to more darkness. TV shows are about murder, our music is about pain and difficulty, or it celebrates things that God never intended for us to celebrate. So it's no wonder that being from a dark world, we have dark thoughts. You and I struggle with sin. We struggle with controlling our sinful nature. 
maybe that comes out in the way that we worry about everything or get anxious about situations that we can't control. Maybe that's evident in how we try to control or manipulate the people in our lives, make sure that our lives are going the way we plan them to go. Whatever it is, it is obvious that we need a weekend like this to get a good dose of good news for once. And that's the beauty of the gospel. It's the good news because the tone it takes, its rhythm, its melody is so different than the world. When Jesus shows up in the first part of Mark, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. That word repent means to turn around, to walk in a completely different direction. And we talked yesterday about how Jesus tells us to listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd and to follow his voice. So the good news is that there is an alternative to the darkness that we find ourselves in. And today, we want to look at the core of this good news because the only reason we can hear the voice of the Good Shepherd, the only reason that we can even respond to the call of God, the only reason that we even have the message of Jesus is that God has forgiven us our sin. Okay. So I can hear some of you and you're thinking, ah, this is a talk for church people, people who like to hear about that old time religion, people who like to listen to those preachers with the big hair and they get all crazy with their hallelujahs and thank you, Jesus. Or maybe you're already a Christian and you're sitting back in your seat and you're thinking, ah, I'll just sip on my tea. This is for those people who have never heard about the gospel or, you know, those people that have never heard that you can be forgiven of your sin. I hope they listen up. You better tell them, preacher, tell them the good news. Hold on a second. This is not a message for someone else. This message is for you, whether you've never heard of the good news of Jesus or whether you've heard it so many times it has become something you take for granted. We need to hear something important about the good news of God today. Do you know why? Because those who have never crossed the line of faith and put their trust in Jesus, for those that are skeptical of Jesus and God and religion, there is a part of you that has serious issues and questions about faith, and they need to be asked and uncovered. But the bigger need in the skeptic, the bigger need in the person who has been burned by religion and wants nothing to do with it is the core need that everyone needs deep down. They need to know they are loved by God no matter what. No matter what, we are truly loved by God and we can obtain his forgiveness. That's so hard to believe because we've done some pretty bad things. We want to look at that today. There's nothing you can do that can take the love of God from you, even if you don't believe in him. The most amazing thing you can discover today as we look at the word is that though you don't believe in God, he believes in you. And yes, for the person who has been a believer and thinks this message is for everyone who is not yet a Christian, this message is for you. Because as is often the case, the longer we've walked with God, the more prone we are to forget the simple truths. There are way too many Christians out there who have forgotten the simple truth of the gospel, and it has two sides to it. First side, Christians often forget the most powerful force in the world is mercy. The most life-giving aroma is the aroma of fresh-baked forgiveness. Forgiveness is beautiful when applied to us, but if that's only where it remains, we forget that we were shown forgiveness in order to use forgiveness. We're not just recipients of grace, we are channels of grace. And so we need to listen to this story today and make sure that we are practicing the art of forgiveness and not just talking about it. See, because it cuts both ways. See, the other side of forgiveness is how we deal with ourselves. There are many Christians out there who have crossed the line of faith, they decided to follow Jesus, and at some point they've forgotten the simple power of forgiveness when it comes to themselves. And in the process of following Jesus, we've messed up, we've made mistakes. And though we talk about grace and we sing about mercy, we can't even find a way to forgive ourselves. If the God of the universe can forgive you, then you can surely find a way. So let's look today at the good news of forgiveness. Turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we're going to read it together. I asked you to read it before you showed up today. It's okay if you didn't. But basically, we're going to be talking about forgiveness at its core. Okay, John chapter 8. In verse 1, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down, wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. 
When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Man, don't you wish you were there? I mean, Jesus, this whole scene, he, he's teaching, it's early in the morning. The religious leaders, you know, they're trying to trap him. They, want, they throw this woman down right next to him and said, look, we caught her in the act of adultery. All right, now think for a minute. How do you catch someone in adultery? And in the early morning, no less, okay? Now, what's interesting is this was the time of Sukkot. It's, it's a festival of tabernacles. This was the time each year that the Jews would remember when the Israelites wandered in the desert. And so their custom was to set up these tiny little shelters. They're like little ramshackle huts. They look like desert dwelling shelters that their ancestors used as they wandered through the desert. So the rules for celebrating this time of year stated that you had to have branches that were set over top of this little shelter. So much so, you know, they had to be wide enough apart that you could see through them. You could see the moon at night, which meant at this time of year, there were shelters that were set up all over the place that people would actually sleep in, and they were see-through. So we don't know for sure, but it was probably a good guess that this woman was engaging in adultery in one of those shelters that other people could see into, and that's how she was caught. But think about that for a second. These shelters, the Sukkot, they were small tabernacles. They were symbols of religious nature. It's like at Easter when you have the empty cross or Christmas when you, you, know, you have the nativity scene, the creche. So imagine what would happen if you caught someone committing the act of adultery in a nativity scene. Not going to lie. That's pretty bold. I don't think there is a comparison chart for sin because all sins are the same in the eyes of God. But if there were, I'm pretty sure that's near the top or the bottom, whoever you want to list it, because it's pretty nasty. So, what is Jesus' reaction? Well, first of all, he takes a moment, and he thinks it through. The scriptures say he stooped down, he wrote into the dust, he stooped down right next to her, bringing himself to her level. No doubt he was processing that they didn't bring the man. Like, where's the guy? Isn't the guy just as culpable? In the Old Testament law, he's just as culpable. So no doubt he's processing that as he's writing in the dust. Perhaps the man was part of the setup, Perhaps he was in league with these people. See, if the religious leaders could show that Jesus was soft on sin and they should let the lady go, then Jesus would be discredited among the people that he'd be soft on sin. But if Jesus demanded that the woman be stoned, then they would poke holes at Jesus' teaching on grace and mercy and possibly even get him in trouble with the Romans for advocating capital punishment. Hmm. So they got him in a double bind. So genius move. Jesus breaks the tension, stoops down near the woman, writes in the dust with his finger. And we don't know what he was writing. Perhaps he was writing about the law of Moses, you know, about those people who were caught in adultery. Maybe he's writing that verse out, waiting to deliver his verdict after he'd written it out. Perhaps he's also writing out the verdict of the people that are standing nearby, listing all of their sins. Perhaps he's writing down the name of each person accusing her with their own special sins. Maybe he's writing down all the people who have visited this lady. Whatever he wrote, it was compelling because when combining the writing with what he said next, everyone leaves. And basically what he says is this. Okay, you know what? Let's stone her. So let the person who has never sinned be the first person to throw the stone. It's genius because it doesn't go light on the law, but it doesn't ignore mercy. It calls out the motives of the men who cornered her. They weren't interested in justice. They were interested in using her to trap Jesus. But the best part is the next part. Look at what Jesus says in verse 10. Then Jesus stood up again and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Think about this for a minute. We have to process a few things. First, Jesus deals with an angry, holy mob, a self-righteous mob, and they calling, calling out their own self-righteousness. And then Jesus deals with this woman. No one condemns you, neither do I. Why? Why wouldn't Jesus say, no one condemns you, but I have a problem with what you did. In a tabernacle? In a nativity scene? Come on, girl, you are much better than that. Why didn't you do that? You know, parents do that. You know, it's what you say to your kid. I raised you to know better. I'm so disappointed with you. Like, why didn't he say that? And you know, listen, as parents, you would say this so that they would learn their lesson, that they would never do this again. Some of us remember doing things as teenagers 
or there are even teenagers who are watching this who know what it feels like. I'm going to get it when dad comes home. But you know it would only be because he loves you and never wants to see you do it again. But Jesus, now this is important, this is so, so important here. Jesus forgives before she asks for forgiveness. It's not like she fell at his feet begging for mercy. No, Jesus has already forgiven her. That's the hardest thing about God's love to figure out. Forgiveness is freely given. Look at Romans 5, 8. If you want to flip over there, if you want to, you don't have to. I can show it on the screen here. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God's forgiveness was evident even while we were all still far away from God. Listen, in this dark age in which we live, where it is a cultural way of life, that you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back double. Jesus tells us that the good news is that God doesn't work like that. God has already forgiven us for our sins, even while we're still sinning. You don't have to get all cleaned up and show yourself worthy of following Jesus in order to be forgiven. That's the good news. All we have to do is believe in it, to enter into it, to receive this free gift of God, to say, God, I accept your forgiveness. And as a result, I want to live my way in a life that honors you and what you've done for me. I want to listen to your voice. I want to follow you as my good shepherd because of what you have done for me. Look, this is the simple truth that you and I forget, that the good news is that you've already been forgiven. If you've never put your trust in Jesus, it's as simple as talking to God and saying, I believe what Jesus said, and I believe it applies to me now as it did for the woman then. I receive your forgiveness, and I want to live my life in light of that forgiveness and walk in your way from now on. Easy. Done. In fact, Jesus says, I forgive you now. Go and sin no more. Now, obviously, he didn't say go and be perfect. What he said was go and live in the good news and in the light of the truth that you are forgiven by God and that truth can be shared with others. Repent for the kingdom of God comes upon you. And it comes upon you when you receive forgiveness and you walk in the way of the kingdom. You gradually leave behind a life of sin. You don't, you don't enter into perfection. You know, it doesn't instantly change. And this is the truth that people who are already Christian need to hear in a fresh way. You are already forgiven. If God forgave all your sins on the cross, and the cross happened 2,000 years ago, then all of your sin in the future, here's your life, here's Jesus, here's the cross, here's your life. All of your sins, past, present, and future, are already wiped out. Jesus' work on the cross has already forgiven all of your sin. That means even when you were a Christian and you cheated on your wife, and now you live with that burdensome sin and worry, you are already forgiven. Talk to someone about it. Confess it to others because God has already forgiven you. Even though you were a Christ follower, you dabbled in some sin and it, you got stuck in it for a while and it made you do and say things that were shameful, and now you live with that guilt, you're already forgiven. Walk in that freedom today. Sometimes the hardest people that we can find forgiveness for is ourselves. That though God has already forgiven you, you still condemn yourself for what you did as a Christian. Listen to me. The blood of Christ is powerful enough to forgive any sin. You might say, yeah, but you don't know what I did. Can it really be as bad as committing adultery in a nativity scene? Can it? Okay. So look, finally, we forget that this forgiveness is contagious. The grace of God should not end with us like a virus. It should infect everyone we connect with. One of the best ways to know if you really understand mercy is if it transforms you into a merciful person. You can't truly accept God's forgiveness. You can't know what it's like to really be forgiven unless it changes the way you interact with others. Forgiven people, forgive people. If you are still holding a grudge, how can you possibly know what forgiveness is? I'm talking to the moms out there. I'm talking to the dads out there that are holding a grudge for the way their kid chose to live their life. Let it go. That is not the way of Jesus. How can you possibly be following Jesus and holding on to someone's sin? It is not in the nature of Jesus to condemn. So you might want to look again at who you're following if you're holding on to a grudge. If you count it as a good thing that you haven't talked to someone in so many years because you're holding on to something, 
God doesn't begrudgingly forgive sin. He went to war for your forgiveness. Jesus stood up to self-righteous people, punched them in the chest and said, look, this is the truth. They are already forgiven. And that is a beautiful truth. That is the good news. Let's pray. God, I pray that as we process this now and we think through it, I ask that, you know, you might put your finger in our chest if there are things that we need to forgive, things we need to let go of. I pray that your Holy Spirit will work inside of us. Help us to feel that today. Help us to know that we need some conviction in this area. And I pray that we would quickly work to resolve with people we have grudges against or that we need to show mercy to. And God, I pray that we would be the kind of Christians that live in the good life of showing mercy and not just talking about it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And thank you, John, for those wonderful, encouraging words and that good news. I loved what Pastor John said where he said, we are already forgiven. That is the good news. Do you realize that? That we are forgiven already. God is not waiting for us to achieve a certain level of good standing before him and then says, okay, I'll decide to forgive now that now. No, he loved us while we are yet sinners. And so if you heed the words of Pastor John and you listen to what he said, he said something very, very remarkable. He said, forgiven people forgive people. And so as we examine our hearts and our minds, is there somebody that we have a trouble forgiving in our lives? See, God has forgiven us while we are yet sinners, but sometimes we have a problem forgiving others. So as we have been challenged by Pastor John, are we looking at people around us with a heart of forgiveness? Because we have been forgiven, and that is the good news. I pray that you have been encouraged by these words, and if you have a, uh, a question, or if you have a, a prayer, or if you want to know about how do I get forgiveness from God through our Lord Jesus Christ, so you would call that number at the bottom of the screen and contact us, or you can even reach out to your pastor, but if you would call that number if you need a Bible or just a word of encouragement, please go ahead and call that number. We'd love to encourage you with that. Uh, we will continue with our theme tomorrow of the good news, and Pastor John and Nicole and Nate will continue to worship and minister to us. If you would join us, and please tell a friend or those that uh, you may know who would be interested, 5 o'clock tomorrow at the same time, and we look forward to seeing you then. يبدل حال اللي ناديك انت قادر يا رب قادر ما بيعصر ولا امر عليك انت قادر ايوه انت قادر يبدل حال اللي ناديك